for his feeling was a master at timing. So in the Pink Panther, one of the things that is unique is that everything is done with timing and action of the Panther, subtleties. Other shows, other cartoons, Yogi Bear and all these others, had to depend on dialogue. Now, the animators had a tough hope. Oh, they had to tell a story with no dialogue. Once in a while, they'd have voiceover telling the story, but most of the time, the visual gag had to go on its own strength. So over the whole world, the panther with no voice can be understood anywhere in the world, any language. What happened was that Frizz Freeling was at Warner Brothers, and then they closed down, but Warner Brothers let them use the facilities with David DePatty and Frizz, and they started doing commercials. And then Blake Edwards came to them with a story called The Pink Panther. And he asked them, would they do a title? And they said, oh, fine. It's better than just doing commercials. So Frizz and Holly Pratt sat down, and Frizz directed Holly Pratt into making it. Frizz made some roughs. And Holly Pratt redefined them, polished them up. And between the two, they came up with many sketches of the Pink Panther. But the thing was that the Pink Panther turned out to be a special thing that clicked with the audience. And on the strength of that, United Artists came and said, will you do a, a theatrical a series of the Pink Panthers? At that time, I was in New York, and I get a call from David, and he says, get your blank back here. We've got a terrific deal cooking. So I got out of my lease, drove back to, to California, and I was right with him from the beginning. They wanted to create a series because the uh, title went over so tremendously. In fact, the reviews were saying the title was better than the movie. And with the combination of him giving some rough sketches to Holly Pratt and giving them some ideas, then Holly Pratt would polish it up. And Frizz said that himself, that, you know, that uh, Holly Pratt was his anchor that made everything look good. If you knew Holly Pratt, he was a tall, slender man, and he was the essence of the Pink Panther. Now, things could have gone a different way. We could have had a short panther like Frizz. But Frizz luckily said, no, make him tall like a Coley Pratt, which is good for everybody. When we did the first cells on him, they used a red grease pencil for the outlines. And it gave the panther a soft look to him, kind of a fuzzy outline. Then. For later on, they said, well, let's try Xeroxing it with a black line. I said, no, you're taking the softness away from the panther. So they tried it, and it just didn't go over well. So they went back to, uh, not the grease pencil this time, they went back to professional girls, they call them inkers, with a brush or a pen. They would just trace the animator's drawings. They put the paper down, then they would take a cell, trace every line in red, and then flip it over and put all the colors to it. Like everything else, you trial and error, you try it. During the time we worked together on this, we did come up and try a voice of Rex Harrison one time on a, a theatrical short. Why can't man be more like animals? And we got a lot of bad comments back because many said, oh, that doesn't sound like what I thought the Panthers should sound like. So they went back to the pantomime. When we printed up the credits, we would send them out and they would be pressed onto a cell, many letters. Consequently, if there was a mistake in the spelling, we would have to do the whole thing over. So I devised a cut letter system 
just cut it out of vinyl sticking paper. So I cut through the paper and transferred the style letters onto the cell. If there was a mistake, all I had to do is take an X-Acto knife, lift the letter off, and replace it with the correct letter. The theatricals that we did, we had the luxury, Frizz had the luxury of taking his time with these. They become what they call, quote unquote, the classics. We didn't have scripts. Nowadays they use scripts. There, each storyboard man was a storyboard artist, and they would write the storyboard and draw it. Frizz would get the writers in his room with the storyboard up on the wall, and then he would act it out and go through it and everybody would participate. And someone would say, gee, if this gag here was a little different or twist there, the, the writer would take notes on that and maybe add it or not add it. And so we had these, they call them snowball sessions where everybody would participate. So it was kind of a knit group. We'd all get together and, and have fun with it. What happens is you take a storyboard and they call it slugging. You take a stopwatch and you kind of act it out so you can tell just about how much footage you need to tell this storyboard. If you turn out and rough timed it and said, wow, this is eight minutes long, it's too long, then the director would say, take out scene one and scene seven, but crop it up to get down to the five or six minutes we need. And then it, then it would go transfer it to an exposure sheet. Pratt liked to use a bar sheet so that Henry Mancini could start his music way in advance of the finished animation. He would write out all his actions, expressions, attitudes. Then that bar sheet would be taken to Johnny Burton, who was our top cameraman, and he would transfer it to an exposure sheet, which then would be given to the animator to animate the levels on the exposure sheet. After the exposure sheets, the director gets the animator in the room he has already planned it, like Holly Pratt and some of the directors. They would put a folder of extreme poses to direct the animator. Each animator had his assistant, and then the scene would then go to an in-between room where they would put every other drawing in that was needed. Then the cameraman and actually put the pencil test on 35 millimeter film. Then we'd all go into the projection room, and we'd run it. As Frizz would sit in there, and he'd say, back it up, move it forward. All right, now, change the panther, don't have them do this, have them do that. And then when the lights went up, they would take their scenes back, fix them, and uh, proceed to go into production, ink and paint, and follow through. The layout people would draw the layout. The ink lines would be transferred to a cell, clear cell. We would take those lines on the cells and then turn it over and put loose colors around a window on a cell. And then we'd put some sponge technique on the wall and a little pattern for the floor, just a little bit with a few lines, and then a flat color on a piece of paper and then drop the cell over it. And that's the style of the technique they used. Holly Pratt, I consider him my mentor. So one time he gave me a scene to animate and it was the Pink Panther shadow boxing. So he said to me, here's the sheets, just take 30, 40 feet and just ad lib it. So I did it and I worked on it. And it came out good and he liked it. So he made me feel good. He rushed in the frizz and he says, come here, take a look at what Art did. So I was writing, designing, wearing many hats. So we had the Pink Panther going, and then when we did series, I had to be there to do, prepare the presentations, make them unique enough that the networks would pay attention to them. So I got into doing three-dimensional pop-ups. So instead of just handing them a script, we'd hand them this folder, and they open it up, and something would pop up. And they'd say, wow, this is unique. This is something different. So uh, I was fortunate to have that situation for me 
because I work on specials, I do titles, wash his car, and I never got paid. <laughs> no, but I would do all that kind of stuff. I had a great opportunity because they would depend on me to prepare the next presentation to the network. So I would be, as I'm finishing up my work, titles and doing all that other work, I would start doing the presentation. So I was never let off. I would be on constantly. My vacations were like one day at a time because they say, we need to get this to the network. And then I was rushed to get that approved so I can get all the people back to work. <laughs> the Pink Plasma was a fun one. It was all about a um, vampire, a little short vampire, and it was the character, again, the little white guy dressed as a vampire. And to this day, I don't know of anyone coming up with a name for him. He was just a little white guy, which, which happens to be for us. <laughs> you know, all the little characters that he created, Yosemite Sam and the little white guy, uh, that, that was Frizz. I had a hate-love relationship with Frizz, and everyone else did too. You know, he could be real gruff, and then, then when he somebody said, "Oh, you're too mean on that guy," and then he'd come over and say, "Oh, I'm sorry, I was so mean." But at the moment, he'd be rah rah rah, you know, like that. <laughs> Toward the end of the movie, you know, Pink Panther's looking out the castle window, and all of a sudden the shoes come up behind him and kick him in the butt. Will you play with me? And that's my voice on there. And I also did a laughing skull in the show at the beginning. So it was fun. You get to wear different hats. Holly Pratt gave him that loose, tall, wonky look and personality. Frizz added all the timing and subtleties to it. <laughs> Jerry Shinicky was Frizz Freeling's favorite for any walk cycles that are unique. So he's the one who came up with the Panther's unique little skip and shuffle that he has in his walk. Then John Dunn made the character really come alive with all his funny gags that he came up with. That session went pretty good. Now to hit the road. Whew. I've drawn the Panther so many years, I feel like he's a part of me. 